The non-lethal weapons market, also often called the less lethal weapons market, and that's the term I'll be using in this episode for reasons I'll get into in a few minutes, is expected to be an $8.37 billion industry in 2020, up from about $5.65 billion in 2015. The logic of less lethal weapons is that it's often undesirable to escalate a conflict if one can avoid doing so. This is true between international entities, a recent dust-up between China and India in contested territory on the border dividing the two countries, for instance, involved physical conflict between military personnel from both countries, but they avoided escalating the confrontation further by sticking to fists, rocks, and wooden clubs as weapons. Part of this confrontation between these countries revolves around the installation of artillery and the introduction of armored personnel carriers and other serious hardware and weaponry into the supposedly peaceful neutral zone. But because they stuck with less lethal weapons, a few soldiers had to be airlifted out to get medical treatment after this brawl in the mountains. But the situation didn't extend any further beyond that. And as of the day I'm recording this, at least, the two countries have announced a series of meetings during which they intend to defuse the situation before it can become something more serious. Now, having to be airlifted out of the Himalayas because you were seriously injured during a rock and club fight with soldiers from the neighboring military power is not nothing. You can cause a lot of damage with professional military combat training alone, and even simple bludgeoning weapons can increase that dangerousness many-fold, but the scale, potency, and casualness with which you can seriously injure and kill increases dramatically when guns and explosives are used. It still takes a decent amount of effort and personal risk to attack another combat-trained soldier with a rock, whereas using a gun would be as easy as pulling a trigger from a safe distance. There's also a psychological distinction between the two types of weaponry. One of them is fairly visceral and hands-on, while the other is not as psychologically removed as, say, piloting a drone from halfway around the world, but it has been shown to be more possible for more people to separate themselves from the consequences of their actions when using a ranged weapon, like a gun, compared to up-close and personal weapons of any kind. We don't have enough data to say for sure why this should be the case, But we do have a decent amount of data about the use of such weaponry by police forces, especially those in the United States, but some from departments around the world as well. And the data indicate that, basically, these weapons overall are fairly effective at preventing emotionally and physically charged encounters between police officers and those they're trying to apprehend from becoming more violent and deadly. Tasers which are a brand of handheld electrical weapon shaped like a gun and which hit their target with two darts before electrocuting them in a way that causes, quote, neuromuscular incapacitation, end quote, which means their muscles lock up and they experience a great deal of pain. Tasers have not been shown to be particularly effective at keeping cops from reaching for their guns in tense moments. Most other types of less lethal weaponry, though, have been shown to be generally effective at this, which is arguably good because once a gun is drawn, there's a far higher likelihood that someone will be permanently injured or killed, and that includes the police officer, because that gun will then be in play, will be potentially grabbed or misfired, and they could accidentally hit one of their fellow officers, but it could also hit the person they're chasing or fighting, or could cause the person to respond to that escalation with their own escalation, pulling their own weapon, leading someone else nearby, an ally of theirs to pull a gun, and so on. Research has indicated that the use of a firearm by anyone involved in such a conflict increases the chance of mortality to someone involved to around 50%. The most effective, less lethal weapons used by cops during their day-to-day jobs seem to be handheld, non-projectile, blunt-force weapons, 
like clubs and shields. Overall injuries to both civilians and police drop by somewhere between 25 to 62 percent when some type of less lethal weapon, with the exception of tasers, is used, though this varies greatly depending on the department and depending on the weapon employed. A study conducted by the U.S. Department of Justice also found that in a normal physical confrontation between police officers and a suspect who is attacking them or fighting back against them, the injury rate for the civilian ranges from 17 to 64 percent, while the injury rate for the officer is somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. And injuries in this case are generally scrapes and bruises, but can also include broken bones, nerve damage, and other very substantial, serious issues of that kind. Part of the argument in favor of using less lethal weapons is that those numbers often decrease when things like pepper spray or stun guns are introduced as an alternative to pulling one's gun. The trouble with some of these numbers, it turns out, though, is that, first, although overall injuries to both officers and those they are apprehending go down, the severity of injuries go up, as does the potential for death for those on the receiving end of those high-yield jolts of electricity meant to cause a temporary loss of bodily control, but at times which also causes heart attack or stroke, and those chemicals meant to disorient and cause discomfort, but which at times instead cause severe respiratory responses that lead to permanent damage or death. There's reason to believe that these tools, when used perfectly and rarely by police officers who are consciously trying to avoid harming the people with whom they are coming into conflict for whatever reason, actually accomplish what they're meant to accomplish in terms of reducing the use of guns and the overall amount of physical harm caused to both perps and cops. But the real world is seldom perfect, and police officers, no matter how well trained, can misuse and overuse tools so that the outcomes are different from what the research implies. What's more, most of the research conducted on these tools describe their use in everyday scenarios catching and taking in criminals or potential criminals who are resisting arrest. These numbers change dramatically in other situations, including their use during public demonstrations, like protests and riots. No matter how useful such weapons seem to be in some other situations, in terms of preventing violence and de-escalating conflict, the opposite is often true during large-scale standoffs, especially when the people on the receiving end of those blows, those chemical agents and those electrical currents, are peaceful, not attacking, not fighting back, and thus arguably, quite rightfully, feeling victimized when the police assault them, even with less likely to be lethal weapons. If you're not attacking anyone, and are in fact obviously non-violent, not intending to cause any harm, and someone attacks you with a rock, that's still pretty messed up. It's uncalled for, and it's likely to cause escalation, even though instead of a rock, they could have used a gun. These less lethal weapons, in other words, are only de-escalatory in situations in which a firefight is a real possibility, and those weapons are a step down from the alternative. In situations where there is no violence, the use of less lethal weapons is an example of the person with those weapons bringing the violence. In such cases, weaponry meant to prevent injury and death instead tend to cause it, and not just in one-off situations, but overall and across time, as police forces using these weapons perhaps accidentally come to instigate and propagate the very cycle of distrust and violence that they ostensibly, at least, were hoping to prevent. Today, I'd like to talk about police violence, the blue wall, and the utility and difficulty of empathy in seemingly intractable, violent situations. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're finding some value in what I'm doing here, consider becoming a supporter. One of the most straightforward ways to do that is to become a recurring monthly supporter at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. Doing so at any level, any amount each month, 
will net you an additional episode of the show each month as well. But there are myriad different ways to do so, both monetary and non-monetary, and you can find a list of those options at letsknowthings.com slash support. Huge thanks to everybody who's already supporting the show, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. Also, if you're enjoying what I'm doing here, you might also enjoy my other podcast, Brain Lenses. You can find that wherever you get your podcasts or at brainlenses.com. All right, let's get back to the show. I have never been tased. I've never been shot with a real deal bullet or with a beanbag round or a rubber bullet or a pepper ball round. I've never breathed in tear gas or pepper spray. I've never been beaten by a police baton. And I've never been attacked by a police dog or struck by a riot shield or casually physically abused by a police officer who had no reason to believe that I was intending violence. I've also never been the target of racial bias. And I say this because, like being waterboarded or experiencing some other kind of violence or abuse, it's a very different thing to speak about these sorts of issues, theoretically, compared to talking about them as a tangible reality that you have felt, that you have suffered, that you fear you might experience again in the future. It's impossible to be unbiased about anything, and that's true of thinking and communication in general. But it's perhaps especially true when it comes to issues like this, when that real world versus theoretical distinction can completely reshape a person's perception of something, to the point where some of the officials who signed off on waterboarding for information gathering purposes have taken back their approval of that practice after being exposed to the barest minimum safest example of what it was that they approved. People who previously supported the use of tasers have likewise changed their mind after being tased themselves. When that pain and helplessness, but also when the theoretical threats and percentages become actual, personally experienced problems, that can change a person's perspective on just about anything. When it's you, or someone you personally know and care about, rather than some theoretical bad guy, facing the 3% chance of death or serious permanent harm after being hit by a less lethal weapon. And that's the generally accepted average for all such weapons, by the way. There is a 3 in 100 chance of death or some kind of permanent injury after being hit by such a weapon. That math comes to look very different than it did before because of that personalization. This conversation overall is complicated by that theory-reality distinction. It's also complicated by other adjacent issues related to the organizational infrastructure of the departments and forces that use these types of weapons, and the evolutions in threats and the perception of threats that these forces face. There's also the pressure that is applied from higher up the pecking order and pressure from within police forces themselves, not to mention the broader cultural pressures that pervade pretty much everything we might do or think about in our modern communication environment, and accompanying ideological paradigms. Now that said, the article I'd like to start with today comes from The Guardian, and it's entitled, Protests About Police Brutality Are Met With Wave of Police Brutality Across United States. On May 25th, 2020, a 46-year-old Minnesota man named George Floyd was arrested for allegedly attempting to use a fake $20 bill at a deli. Police caught him and said that he resisted arrest, which is why, they say, they had to pin him down on the ground outside his car. One of the arresting officers kneeling on his neck for nearly nine minutes while he was down there prone in the road. Floyd, an African-American man, died during that arrest, and footage shot on smartphones by bystanders and surveillance cameras from nearby buildings, showed that the reports provided by the police officers involved about Floyd's supposed resistance and other circumstances leading up to his death were at best misleading and in many particulars outright obvious lies. Floyd's arrest was streamed to Facebook Live 
by one of these bystanders, and that video shows Floyd repeatedly saying, I can't breathe, asking the officer holding him down to let up on his neck, saying at one point, my stomach hurts, my neck hurts, everything hurts, before asking for water, begging the police officers not to kill him, and near the end, crying out for his mother. The bystanders watching all of this go down, recording it, repeatedly asked the officers to let up on him, saying that Floyd was not resisting, was not doing anything to warrant that kind of treatment, but the officers involved said that he was fine because he was talking, though eventually, as seen in that and other videos, Floyd goes quiet. The bystanders bring this up, telling the officer that he's killing Floyd, but the officer didn't let up even then, and by the time an ambulance arrived, Floyd was dead. The video of all this, if you haven't seen it, is incredibly difficult to watch. Floyd's suffering and fear are abundantly evident, as is the shock and fear and outrage of bystanders, and their frustration at their inability to help this man who's being victimized, who seems like he's being murdered in front of them in broad daylight, because the police who are killing him could potentially attack them next. That undertone is unfortunately common in many of these sorts of encounters. Police have all of the power, even when they're doing something illegal, dangerous, or otherwise wrong. There's very little anyone else can do to stop them. And in some cases, police officers do assault those who capture evidence of them, doing these illegal, dangerous, wrong things. Smashing their phones, arresting them, assaulting them, in some other fashion using the power they wield to reduce threats to or eliminate challenges to that power that they possess. In police forces around the United States and around the world, officers have used the tools and privileges they wield to frame those who would out them, to destroy the very evidence that they're meant to preserve, and in some cases, personally enrich themselves or their departments. It's difficult to figure out the scope of this problem, though, in large part because of those same powers that these police forces wield, and how they use them. They have the power over life and death. They have the power to obstruct any justice that might be aimed at them, and they have the power to guide that same justice in unjust ways, to use the pointy end of government power to increase their own power, and to diminish the power, the rights, which are supposedly the birthright of any citizen living in the United States, of others. And though we don't have reliable numbers on how frequently this happens, the anecdotal situations in which it does, and where evidence of it is captured, reinforces suspicions that many people hold about these supposed enforcers of the law. Cops behaving illegally, violently, and corruptly, in plain view, makes it seem as if they don't think there will be consequences for their actions. It also implies, rightly or wrongly, that this kind of behavior is common enough that the instances for which there is evidence represent only a tiny sliver, the tip of the iceberg, of what's happening beneath the surface, in circumstances where there are not bystanders with cameras, and in which the video evidence is not as viscerally disturbing, capturing the scale of attention that this particular video did. In this case, though, there was evidence. It was recorded and streamed live, and it struck a nerve, nationally and internationally. The response was swift, and protests were organized around the country and around the world, protests centering on this case, but also, more broadly, what this case represents in the minds of many. The all-too-common and widespread abuse, often including unjustifiable use of force against African Americans at the hands of police officers around the United States, The protests were substantial enough, the public sufficiently shocked and appalled that legal action was taken against the officers involved fairly quickly. The day after Floyd's killing, it was announced that the four officers were placed on leave, then later the same day, it was announced that they had been fired. Officer Derek Chauvin, the officer who had kneeled on Floyd's neck during the arrest, was himself arrested on May 29th and charged with third-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter though unintentional second-degree murder was eventually added to that list as well. The three officers who were with Chauvin when he allegedly killed Floyd 
and legally, it's still considered an alleged killing as of the day I'm recording this, and that is true in the legal sense until the court has officially decided on the matter, no matter what the video shows. Those three officers have been charged with aiding and abetting second-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter because they enabled Floyd's death by doing nothing to prevent it, and even helping Chauvin do what he did. A conviction for Chauvin could result in decades in prison for him and for the other three officers, potentially. It's very possible, though, that Chauvin will either not be charged or will get a relative slap on the wrist because of how these things tend to play out due to advantages that police officers and some other government officials receive when it comes to facing the United States legal and justice system. This systemic exceptionalism, the rationales behind it, the culture that emerges from it and wants to sustain it, and the consequences of that mentality are all components of this story and of the shamefully high number of other stories like this one that are either covered up or ignored today, but also those which have taken place throughout the history of the United States. The first of several components of that cultural and infrastructural foundation that I want to address here is a legal concept called qualified immunity. Qualified immunity operates a bit like tenure for government officials, and this is true in slightly different ways depending on whether we're talking about federal law or local state law. The specifics are different case by case, as is the scope of its application and who it applies to. But regardless of the scale, the thinking behind qualified immunity is that if police officers and other government officials are beholden to the law in the same way as everyone else, there's a good chance that criminals will figure out how to essentially blackmail or neutralize these individuals by threatening to keep them under near-constant threat of legal action. If you're a crime lord who wants to get the whammy on a local cop who's looking into your illegal dealings, you can figure out how to frame that cop or honeypot them into doing something that looks, or actually is, illegal, and then either press charges to get them off the force and off your case, or make it known that you could if you wanted to, which could then disincentivize those officers from looking into you because they want to keep their job. Key to understanding why this would be effective is recognizing that here in the United States, everyone is suing everyone pretty much all the time, a huge swath of our legal and justice system is predicated on incentives that themselves are predicated on the fact that misbehavior of any kind can result in a lawsuit, which could in turn result in civil charges and or being financially ruined. Within that context, it makes a sort of sense that you would want to provide some kind of shielding to those who are facing off against legit criminals in the same way that you might want to provide them with additional weaponry and physical protection if they're going to be facing off against people who have big guns and the skills to use them. By that same logic, it would be ineffective and perhaps even reckless to send law enforcement into work with pistols when the criminals they face are kitted out with assault rifles. So with time, police departments have been granted bigger guns heavier armor and shields, all kinds of exotic weaponry and tactical gear to try to help rebalance things in their favor. Similarly, legal protections that insulate them from the threat of potential legal assaults by those criminals were initially implemented at a low level and then over time upgraded and scaled based on perceived legal threats from criminals who might try to hobble individual officers or departments asymmetrically gaining advantage in that larger conflict through the courts, using the non-physical weaponry available to those who can afford decent lawyers in the United States. This type of legal insulation has increased in scale and effectiveness over time, due in part to the also ever-increasing power wielded by police unions. A labor union, generally called a trade union outside the U.S., is an organization of people working in a particular trade that works on behalf of those people and their trade. One of the main benefits of a union for folks who join them is that it can provide them with a counterbalance to the power often wielded by employers 
The ability to fire people who ask for better work conditions, for instance, is incredibly common throughout the history of labor around the world. And unions counter that capability by leveling the threat of collective action against abusive employers. All of the employees in the union could walk off the job, leaving that employer without income. And depending on the scale of the union, maybe even without the ability to hire replacement workers, at least for a while. Unions also often act on behalf of their members and people working in their trade in general, politically by lobbying on behalf of their constituents, presenting their case to politicians and other decision makers to try, over time, to adjust society more broadly so that it favors those tradespeople, rather than favoring, for instance, their employers. Police unions are essentially the same as any other union, with a few key differentiators. Union membership for a variety of reasons, is down across most industries in the U.S., but it's been increasing within law enforcement, which means more dues are paid and thus more monetary resources are available, but also more human resources, more people who are part of these efforts to rebalance the system in their favor. Again, like any union tries to do, because those on the other side of all negotiations will try to do the same for themselves. Police unions also have political advantages, though, in that politicians who can claim that local cops are on their side gain both an often huge block of reliable votes from officers and their families, but there's also a potentially big disadvantage for politicians who do not have the support of local law enforcement. There's an implicit lack of cohesion in a government that doesn't have the officers on the ground aligned with the decision makers up top, and though this doesn't generally mean that police officers will intentionally try to hamstring an administration that doesn't kowtow to their desires, at times there are small things they can do while still also performing their jobs that hurt the political fortunes of non-aligned politicians, including just saying publicly that so-and-so politician is soft on crime, which means just about every politician from just about every political stripe will do what they can to make the police force happy, which includes slow, steady increases in their power, privileges, influence, and yes, their defense and weaponry, both of the physical and legal variety. I want to emphasize one more time here, before moving on, that this is something that all unions do, to some degree. It's just that police unions are especially good at it, and have been way more successful than most other unions over the past handful of decades. This isn't a case of them behaving badly, necessarily, and it isn't them being incongruous with the way other labor organizations act, or would like to act. It's a somewhat predictable outcome, based on their membership levels and the soft power advantages that they enjoy because of the type of work that they do and the role that they perform within society. Far less in line with other union organizations, though, is a cultural aspect of police forces around the United States and around the world to some degree, but especially in the U.S., often called the Blue Wall. There are honor codes baked into professional and non-professional organizations of all shapes and sizes, and those codes often allow individuals within those groups to enforce types of conduct that are not formally dictated by actual law. Not stealing customers or clients from other members of your trade might be one such norm. And that norm may not be legally enforceable, but it could be that if you're an electrician and you swipe someone else's customer, all the other electricians in the area will know about it and talk about it and never again help you when you need help, never again send new customers your way, and maybe will prevent you from joining local organizations or benefiting from local trade-specific resources. The blue wall is that type of norm enforcement mechanism, and it's especially potent in part because of the solidarity that's often required and enforced within professions where there's actual physical danger at play. If you don't have your coworkers back, someone might actually get hurt, and thus everyone is very careful to make sure that those relationships stay strong, lest they lack their colleagues' assistance when they need it 
at a dangerous moment. There's also a more general baked-in reflex that most of us have, as a default, to conform with what seems to be the dominant way of doing things, in most cases, unless we are violently, dramatically jolted from that default in some way. But the strength of those unions also reinforces this cultural mechanism in this case, resulting in a situation in which police officers need each other in order to stay safe. Resentment within the ranks could make everyone less safe, and if you do something to piss off other officers, there's a chance that you could be booted from the union, denied support and resources, and maybe even kicked out of the force, losing your job and livelihood because you did something that wasn't technically against the rules, but you defied a cultural norm, you stepped out of line, which makes you a weak point from their perspective in the system and a weak point that can be extricated asymmetrically. A reason can be found for you to be fired or otherwise removed from duty, or you can be just harassed or annoyed until you quit, so that, in their eyes, you are no longer able to put your norm-adhering and norm-enforcing colleagues at risk. So qualified immunity bolsters a police officer's ability to get away with illegal things, and strong police unions reinforce that potential increasing the power of police and their departments over time, and also upping the potency of qualified immunity. In many districts, for instance, it's common for police to have their records, which show, among other things, all of the complaints against them and misdeeds that they've committed, completely deleted, wiped from their records, every few years. This means that officers with many complaints against them will be less likely to be caught because that evidence will not accumulate over time, which distorts their pattern of behavior. And it also means that the systems that would notice such things, and which would punish those who commit crimes and who otherwise behave badly, are substantially weakened. And in some cases, when those patterns still catch up with someone, justice is actually relegated to the police unions themselves. And the incentives for such unions line up in favor of them not punishing their officers too harshly. Thus, when police unions have the power to punish police officers, they generally either don't, or they give the officers a relative slap on the wrist, rather than the punishment that anyone else would receive, which, if you think about it, makes membership in these unions even more vital. It's a kind of insurance. If you are part of one, you can get away with a lot more. Whereas if you're not, you're maybe subject to the same rules and regulations as anyone else, as any normal human being, which means that you are more likely to suffer actual consequences for your actions. It's a very compelling, self-reinforcing setup, and all of the pieces make a sort of justifiable sense individually, but in aggregate, some very toxic incentives and outcomes can emerge further amplifying the consequences of the structural law enforcement circumstances here in the United States is the relatively recent trend of what's often called police militarization. Entities as diverse as the FBI, the ACLU, and the Charles Koch Institute, a federal bureau, a civil liberties organization, and a libertarian nonprofit, respectively, have raised concerns about this trend conducted and sponsored research into it, and raised warning flags about where it might go next. The fundamental concept of police militarization follows the same logic that I outlined earlier. Special Weapons and Tactics, or SWAT teams, were introduced into the U.S. law enforcement arsenal back in the mid-1970s, meant to be deployed when normal law enforcement tactics and hardware wasn't sufficient to deal with the threat at hand. In most cases, this meant hostage situations, militarized criminal organizations, and the like. Situations in which a normal cop with a pistol and handcuffs wasn't sufficient, and helmets, riot shields, battering rams, smoke grenades, high-powered rifles, helicopter deployments, and grenade launchers were more appropriate for the threat in question. SWAT teams got special training, access to harder core equipment, and were called in during these special circumstances to take care of things. The aforementioned logic of keeping up with enemy escalation, though, led to an expansion in this model, and Section 1033 of the National Defense Authorization Act 
an expansion of previous programs, allowed police forces around the United States to acquire some types of military hardware for, quote, bona fide law enforcement purposes that assist in their arrest and apprehension mission, end quote. And that, quote, preference is given to counter-drug and counter-terrorism requests, end quote. This act was signed by then-President Bill Clinton in 1996 and came into effect in 1997, and a lot of the equipment requested and granted through this program are relatively mundane items like sandbags, electrical wiring, flashlights, and even fax machines, things that especially smaller police departments around the country would have trouble affording themselves, but which they were able to get through this program on the military's budget for free or at a significant discount. They basically just have to pay for the shipping, and once received, for storage and upkeep. Everything else is covered by the U.S. military budget. A few milestones significantly influenced the direction this program took, however. Wars, both declared and undeclared, mostly in the Middle East, especially Iraq and Afghanistan, led to a huge surplus in used and new equipment that was suddenly available in large quantities for these police forces. And there's evidence that some of the manufacturers of this equipment essentially marketed their gear to law enforcement officials, convincing them to request more of these items from the military so that the manufacturers could then sell higher quantities of their Humvees, armored personnel carriers, combat boats, and the like to the U.S. government. The terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, also shifted the perception and logic of this program as police forces around the U.S. went into high alert, in part because everyone was doing so to some degree, and in part because all the messages they were receiving from the government indicated that we were at war on our home turf, and it was likely that the next 9-11 would happen in their own backyards if they weren't careful. During this period, many police forces were encouraged to stock up on military-grade weapons and found that it was suddenly much easier to justify requisitioning machine guns and grenade launchers and other sorts of weapons, even if they were operating out of a town of a few thousand people in the middle of nowhere. Basically, just say that anything you want will be used to prevent terrorism, and you could get just about anything you wanted through these programs. The dramatic increase in mass shootings in the United States also played a role in this militarization effort, with local cops and even school-based police forces feeling outgunned and powerless when teenagers with store-bought assault rifles and homemade explosives started showing up at their workplaces, gunning down dozens of people before they could pull their comparably underpowered pistols from their holsters and figure out what was going on and how to respond. As a result, even more heavy equipment was requested and distributed, including to one- and two-person school-based police forces, out of perhaps justified fear that they would find themselves unable to protect students, teachers, and administrators should one of these increasingly common shootings happen at their school. The aggregate effect of 1033 being passed, and these wars and different sorts of terrorist attacks being successfully conducted, changing in many ways the default psyche of the American public, including law enforcement and law enforcement-adjacent decision-makers, was the internal deployment of a vast arsenal of incredible, powerful weaponry, and police forces having access to and some training with that weaponry, but generally very little opportunity to use it. Which does not imply that cops are just sitting around bored eyeing the grenade launcher in the department arsenal, waiting for the opportunity to blow some stuff up. But there is a substantial body of evidence that says the availability of such weapons increases the likelihood that those in possession of them will be more likely to decide that circumstances warrant their use, even if they would find other ways to accomplish the same ends if they did not have those weapons. In other words, every problem starts to look like a nail when you have access to a hammer And in this case, the hammer, very often, is a grenade launcher. One more point worth mentioning here is that the U.S. government's war on drugs underpins a lot of how police forces work today. You could argue 
that this metaphorical war stems from anti-morphine and anti-heroin efforts back in the 19th century, but it really came into its own in a very large, law-enforcement-evolving way in the 1970s and 80s, under then-presidents Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan, both of whom made the criminalization of various drug-related activities fundamental components of their campaigns and administrations, and those efforts proved popular enough with some demographics that they were expanded further under the administrations of George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton into the 1990s. There have, arguably, been some positive benefits of anti-drug use and anti-drug distribution efforts of this kind, as huge swaths of that industry are tied to organized crime, slavery, and other violent, horrible things around the world. The overwhelming consensus about the war on drugs, though, is that it's been an incredible and incredibly expensive failure, having targeted the wrong things pretty much throughout its existence, and serving more than anything as an excuse to illegalize behavior that older and more conservative voters find to be distasteful and scary, while also serving as an excuse to target lower economic classes and minorities. The so-called war on terror is arguably similar in that there are some positive effects of some of the efforts funded and implemented under the auspices of this metaphorical war, but the majority of funding and effort seems to be a militarized version of what in lawmaking is called pork barrel spending. Things that make voters happy that seem to be good on the surface, but that don't really do anything useful in reality, and are very often mostly just things that allow those in charge to accomplish what they want to accomplish, even if it has nothing to do with the larger program's supposed goals. When it comes to local law enforcement, one of the major impacts of these overarching anti-drug and anti-terrorism programs has been stoking fear to grant more power to authorities, people being willing to give up rights in favor of perceived security in moments in which it seems like the world is on fire, and an enemy is just beyond view, waiting to attack their town for, apparently, drug and or terrorism purposes. Police forces, then, are both more afraid, being made up of human beings as they are, but also playing to the crowd. They have to become more visibly powerful and intimidating, because otherwise they won't seem to be doing their jobs. And thus, they could have some of their power taken away by their constituents, criticized for not being sufficiently militant when people are afraid and looking for that type of reassurance. The militarization of police forces, then, is also, at times, an outward-in effect, desired because of what it implies rather than what it does, a bit like many of the paces we're put through at airports today, some of which are actually effective, but many of which exist because security theater is considered to be necessary to keep people thinking about those perceived dangers and how they are safe because of military and law enforcement authorities, while also potentially making people feel safer because it seems like something is being done. There are visible changes to the order of things, and as a result, we feel that perhaps we have less to worry about because look at all the hardware and armor and assault rifles. Unfortunately, like many of those broadly implemented airport security measures, most of the militarization efforts made by police forces around the country seem to be ineffective at best, but in some cases, actively harmful rather than helpful, based on the ostensible intended outcomes. It's been found that the use of paramilitary tactics and equipment by normal law enforcement officers leads to an increase in injuries and death for the people on the receiving end of their efforts, be they actual criminals or peaceful protesters, and in some cases for the police officers themselves as well, while also substantially decreasing public opinion of these police departments for all except the most right-leaning portion of the voting public, which tends to favor somewhat more authoritarian approaches when it comes to policing. And I use that term here neutrally, meaning police that position themselves as authorities to be obeyed, rather than implying that they are being Stalinistic or something along those lines. Part of the theorized reasoning behind these numbers, that this sort of approach and these sorts of weapons put everyone at greater risk, while also reducing the public perception of the police forces that use them, 
is that a lack of public trust in law enforcement can lead to a spiral in which people who might otherwise accept the judgment and authority of police officers instead come to mistrust their motives and do not trust them to behave in a non-violent and non-corrupt manner. As a result, situations that could be easily diffused and de-escalated by a more trustworthy police force are more likely to escalate, because members of the public are both less likely to call on them early during a developing problem, and because they're less likely to trust that officers will decrease tensions rather than escalating them further. When the public sees you as a wannabe military branch that sees them as the enemy until proven otherwise, it makes sense that this type of mistrust toward the police would lead to more mutual mistrust over time. And that, in turn, can lead to negative public perception, but can also increase the risk of overall harm to everyone involved. Research also suggests that officers with military equipment are more likely to see more problems as nails requiring the use of their fancy, high-end, often quite deadly hammers, and that the increasingly common self-perception that some police officers have of themselves as military personnel, stoked by that internal culture that they have, but also by outside paramilitary training courses that are predicated on seeing the public as enemy combatants and treating them accordingly, adjusts the entire dynamic between law enforcement and the public that they're meant to serve and protect in a way that leads to a lot more conflict between the two, as does abuse by law enforcement against members of the public, who they have come to view, in many cases, as dangerous, irrational, and in some ways as the other, a psychological concept that can cause us to perceive our fellow human beings as something less than human, and who can be treated, therefore, as less than human. Important to note here is that this collection of influences and variables can, with time, under the radar, sway the behavior of even the most ardent, moral, well-meaning person in uniform, can cause them to do things that, if they stopped to think about it, they would realize are antithetical to how they believe law enforcement should behave, and antithetical to who they perceive themselves to be as human beings. Slow, steady shifts have a way of changing our norms invisibly. And when we live within a sort of cultural bubble, that's even more true. Everything around us seems to reinforce the norms that we adopt. And it's easy for negative norms that hurt us and other people to subtly lock into place, only noticeable when we take a big step back and look at the big picture, or through the lens of retrospect, after things have changed even further, both of which are difficult to do in the moment, when such recognition and perspective would be most valuable. Vitally important to recognize in this conversation, too, is that even the most non-violent protester respecting by-the-book police officer can fall prey to biases and inequalities that latently exist within the system that they are trying to maintain, protect, and implement. The United States was created by slaveholders and built on the back of slaves. Immigrants and perceived others of all kinds have been used and abused throughout our history. And we've come a very, very long way in the past couple of centuries, but we are nowhere near solving some of the more fundamental issues that pervade both our cultural mores and our systemic frameworks. All of which is to say that there's a lot of racism in modern America, alongside all of the other biases and prejudices, and all of these things can take many shapes. Sometimes it's overt, some people clinging to the idea that certain groups of people are just inherently superior to other groups of people. The difference is indicated by country of origin, or gender, or skin color, or creed. While other people don't consciously believe such things, but instead often completely unconsciously and accidentally reinforce inequalities through our traditions, legal systems, the focuses of our law enforcement efforts, the knee-jerk responses that we have to the unfamiliar, and our understanding or lack of understanding about the very different experiences, access to resources, starting points, and outcomes that are accessible to and expected by different groups of people coming from different backgrounds 
with different influences not dictating necessarily, but definitely guiding, at times quite forcefully, the potential paths that their lives might take. We've come a long way, but there's still a huge amount of inequality in the way that society operates. And some of that is based on historical happenings that have rippled through the generations to today. Even a small difference, a small advantage or disadvantage, a long time ago, massively inflated by time and sociological, psychological, and economic compound interest, those distinctions even greater when the initial inequality was larger. Some of it is the consequence of weaving social biases and norms and prejudices into the fabric of society, to the point where even if those who enforce the law and uphold societal norms are not themselves overtly racist and would never consciously judge another person by the color of their skin or want them to have different rights than they themselves enjoy, the mere application of those interwoven laws and norms can lead to essentially the same outcome, even if there's no intention to do so, on the part of the potentially quite moral person who is enforcing those laws and norms. There was a major riot in Detroit in 1967, sparked by police action against an unlicensed after-hours bar, but then stoked into a conflagration by back-and-forth violence between Detroit cops and black residents. When all was said and done, this violence led to 43 deaths, nearly 1,200 injuries, over 7,200 arrests, and more than 2,000 buildings destroyed. It was the worst riot in the United States since the draft riots during the U.S. Civil War, and it would remain the worst riot in the U.S. until the riots in Los Angeles nearly 30 years later in 1992. Then-President Lyndon Johnson convened the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, often called the Kerner Commission, once the riots had spun down, in an attempt to understand what caused them and how such events might be avoided again in the future. The commission produced their final report about a year later, in 1968, and determined that a holistic collection of a large number of systemic issues, many of which affect all sorts of people, but most of which disproportionately and negatively influenced African Americans, and those systemic issues were at the root to blame for the riots. The report called out the federal and state governments for failed policies on housing, education, and social services. The news media, too, was called out for portraying black communities through a biased lens, often talking about and showing African Americans as a type of other, rather than as one of us, instead of being reported upon in a way that indicated that their norms and concerns should be thought about as our norms and concerns. Black communities were often reported about as outsiders that behaved in strange and shocking and completely unknowable ways. The main cause of urban violence, from everyday street crimes to violent riots, this report concluded, was the prevalence of racism from white Americans toward black Americans, and the way that white Americans behaved, voted, and structured the society that they primarily controlled as a consequence of their own norms, values, and casual dismissal of the norms and values of their African-American countrymen. To put this report into further context, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated about a month after it was published. Every killing by police of a person like George Floyd, or Breonna Taylor, or Eric Garner, or Sandra Bland, is a tragedy unto itself. But it's also representative of a larger collection of similar crimes, often committed without punishment for those committing them, against people who belong to groups that have long been disadvantaged by the very systems that are meant to serve and benefit all of us. It's not at all clear what the solution to this problem, and all of the many problems connected to it, might be. It seems unlikely to me that there is a single solution, actually. Research into the reduction and prevention of police violence does seem to indicate that demilitarization and restrictions on the use of force by police officers often leads to positive results for both the officers and those with whom they come into contact and at times confrontation, and that the most successful long-term efforts in this space 
include a sort of hearts and minds approach toward communities, rather than aggressive, militarized stances that stoke mutual fear and distrust, and thus perpetuate the violence cycle for everyone involved. Research also shows that for every 10 local agencies that focus on community well-being, providing services and support for community members, but which also serve as a sort of counterbalance to the police, calling them out for bad behavior and using their own local influence to do so when appropriate. The local murder rate goes down 9%, violent crime drops 6%, and property crime is reduced by 4%. And again, that is for every 10 such groups. So it's possible to create local counterbalances that make an area safer for everyone involved, including police officers, who thenceforth have fewer dangerous situations that they have to confront. There are other options being discussed right now as well, some with a bit of data to go on, some with essentially no research at all that tells us how they might actually play out in real life if implemented. I will say that the idea of shifting some responsibilities and funding away from police departments so those tasks can be performed by more appropriate specialists and that money can be invested in those efforts more directly, is interesting. In practice, this would probably mean folks would be more likely to get counseling or access to a therapist, social worker, or addiction group, rather than a criminal record for minor crimes. And resources that are now being used in ways that stoke that cycle of violence would instead be applied to addressing root-level systemic issues, many of which, again, disproportionately affect certain groups including African Americans, and many of which, over time, spiral into many of the violent situations that community members and police officers eventually have to face. Rather than being a punishment for police departments, such efforts would probably free them up to do more of the work that they are rightfully celebrated for, rather than the low-level grunt work that many of them have been forced to take up and spend their time on to everyone's detriment in recent decades. Again, though, I honestly don't have any sense of what collection of policies, regulations, and changes would work best here. I'm dealing with a lot of theory with all of this, and the lived experiences of the people directly involved could very well point in a wildly different direction from that of any conjecture that I might make. <laughs> If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. You can find a list of ways to do that at letsknowthings.com support. Patreon is a great option if you're looking to support the show on a regular basis and are keen to receive some additional bonus episodes. But non-monetary options are also very helpful. Sharing the show with a friend, leaving a quick review wherever you get your podcasts, and or sharing your favorite episode on your social network of choice. A huge thanks to everybody who's already supporting the show in some way, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book that I'd like to recommend today is a great courses book, so I consumed it in audiobook form. I believe there's also a PDF version of it, and it's called Utopia and Terror in the 20th Century by Dr. Vejas Gabriel Lou Levicius. This book this course is super relevant right now in particular because it covers the emergence of different sorts of terror campaigns and different sorts of fascist and authoritarian campaigns throughout history. And he does a good job of making the connection between the desire for utopia, for more perfect states and ways of being, and how truly horrible things, how great atrocities can emerge out of the best intentions, and in some cases actual good intentions from everyone involved, and in some cases good intentions that some people believe, but the actual implementers of what's happening don't actually believe. They're using those good intentions as a way to draw more people in and get them to support what is ultimately a negative cause. I tend to think it's important to understand the past for its own right, but also because it helps us make better decisions about the future, and this collection of stories, essentially, 
from history about this particular topic is unfortunately relevant right now and no doubt will also be relevant in the future as it tends to be a recurring theme throughout human society. If any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Utopia and Terror in the 20th Century by Vejas Gabriel Lou Levicius. You can find out more about me and my work, including the books that I've written, at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other podcast, Brain Lenses, at brainlenses.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. Feel free to reach out and say howdy on your social network of choice. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook, and Colin is my name on Twitter and Instagram and such. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Thank you.